I guess what, what I think that means is like when you're busy, it's harder to see the big picture. You just start become, or I do, I'll, I start becoming an implementer and just like a go, 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 do, 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 do. Welcome back to In Residence. I'm Keith. And I'm Laura. Hey, Laura. Hey, Keith. How are you doing? I'm doing a lot better. Good. I missed you. I missed you too. We were gone for about 10 Ten days. 10 (laughs) days. On your fabulous puzzling retreat, as I called it. (laughs) Yes, sponsored by COVID-19. Glad you're home. We're fortunate that you got to go off and have some alone time without us, and we didn't get sick. Knock on wood. You got a lot of puzzling done? I did. I busted through four puzzles. I read an entire book, got through half of another book, still got to do lots of work virtually, played a lot of piano. I don't think I told you that. Mm, You mentioned that you played a little bit, but in passing. So what were you playing? I was playing some Schumann, the scenes from childhood. That's Kinderson. So there's three different songs that I used to play all the time in college and just growing up, but mostly college and after. It was fun to get back into those. It's interesting because your fingers don't quite sit as confidently as they need to for you to make it musical. And so it's not even just getting the notes under your fingers, but making the music sound musical like I used to be able to do. Took some time, but they're very short. So I was able to play them all, the three that I like to play all the time. The pieces? The pieces. Movements or what are they? I think they're pieces. Okay. Yeah. Etudes. That's what I used to study. (laughs) <laughs> or guitar. Etudes. All the Fernando Sor etudes. Oh. <laughs> or whatever. So fancy. But I was able to uh, to play that, which was kind of nice. I was in a room that had piano and then had a huge table, so I would puzzle. And then I would go over and I'd play some piano. And then, yeah, it was good. I mean, besides being sick. Being sick was not fun. <laughs> so, it was no joke. It's all behind you now, right? So just think of the... Think of the happy moments, right? I watched through an entire two seasons of Fisk on Netflix, which I found quirky and oddly fun. You messaged me to watch that. So I I think I've watched three episodes. It's funny. It's quirky. It's kind of like Flight of the Concords. Not the same, but similar. I was playing a lot of guitar when you were gone too. Yeah? Well, a lot more than I usually do, I should say. That's funny that we were both going back to our instruments. All right. Well, what are we going to talk about today? The last day I was on my little puzzling retreat, you sent me a link to a YouTube video, to a TED Talk Mm -hmm. on, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was called How to Multiply Your Time by Rory Vaden. And that was brought to my attention by my friend Carolina. I, I love it when I find something like that, that resonates, and then I share it with you and it it resonated with you. Yeah. And I think what was interesting is I like to listen to a lot of podcasts when I puzzle. And so you sent me that. And at the same time, I was doing an online virtual workshop all on managing my time. (laughs) And so I thought it was actually fairly interesting that you and I had both ended up here on time management. It's what I've been thinking about a lot too lately. And it feels like a a good time to talk about it, right? Absolutely. I think the thing, the reason it resonated so much with me right now, isn't that we just happened upon these at the same time, but having 10 days by myself in a house where I'm puzzling and I'm doing music and I'm reading and I'm doing music and then I'm intentionally figuring out my meal prep and what, you know, I got to spend much more time on being intentional about how I spent my time, when I spent my time, and this is a really good time to reset that feeling of there's never enough time in the day. I have to just run faster (laughs) to get as much done as possible or prioritize like a boss better, where I thought what you shared and Carolina shared with you was really powerful because it kind of takes that concept, that logical concept of if you prioritize, if you have a to-do list, if you simply do time blocking, you're going to be able to 
win at this time management thing and be as efficient as possible and productive as possible. I don't know if that's the end goal always. Yeah, efficiency can only get you so far. Like at a certain point, you can't be more efficient and you can almost get stuck in that loop. What I mean is I can get stuck in that loop of continued improvement and I have to balance how much time am I putting in versus the diminishing returns, I guess. Does it need to be better or does it need to simply be done? Right. And so figuring out when it's appropriate for me to be more efficient is something for me to pay attention to because I do really like figuring out a better way of doing certain things. It's just as long as it doesn't get in my way. So I think we should talk about the idea of thinking about time management or time in a three-dimensional way that Rory Vaden talked about in the TED Talk. When I think about time management, the thing I've always really clung to is the uh, Stephen Covey matrix. I think we've talked about this. And, and I thought it was fascinating because I like the two by two matrix of urgency and importance, right? Like how soon does something need to be done? And then how important is it that it gets done? If you put those against each other and you have four quadrants, There's everything from crisis putting out fires, and there's only so many things that really should be that true crisis to things that should be greater in a priority list, something that's more strategic. So something that is high in importance, but low on urgency, because it takes time to to step away and to plan and to set yourself up to be successful in the future. And so when he was talking about the Covey matrix, right? The importance and urgent matrix that I've written on so many whiteboards when I need to like jostle myself to to be like, okay, wait, you have too much on your to-do list. You got to start putting it into a category here so you can get the big rocks. But what happens when you have too many priorities, then time you have to put them in, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of his point. Yeah. So the thing that I wrote down in my notebook around prioritizing prioritizing is that nothing about prioritizing creates more time. I wrote that down too. That blew my mind. Yeah. Why did that blow my mind so much? Yeah, I, it really stuck out to me too. And that was early on in the video. And I paused it, wrote that down. And there's something there. He says it just simply helps you reorder your priorities and that in itself is a good thing right but it's not what we think it is it's not giving us more time to do the things precisely (laughs) as somebody that lives by multiple to-do lists i i think if you saw my notebook from work it might make your head explode (laughs) because the number of post-its i have with to-do lists that then I have added on top of another post-it with to-do list. I call it, depending on how busy I am, it turns into what I call my post-it garden on my desk. And so it's multiple post-its that just have different to-dos or somebody's name at the top with things that I need to make sure to talk to them about. And so as someone that cultivates her post-it garden and relies upon it, yeah. To help me remember the priorities, prioritize the priorities, and get stuff done. Again, it blew my mind that prioritizing doesn't create more time because he's right, but it's hard because I spent a lot of my time working on getting better at prioritizing to find those golden nuggets of extra time. Right. Does that make sense? Because that's the technique or the tactic that we think we have is, oh, if I can line these all up in the right order, it'll go faster or I'll have more time to do it. It doesn't make more time, which hence, like, the whole talk is how to multiply your time. What it had me thinking of, and I'm not, because he said something about juggling in there, Mm -hmm. that we're all just kind of juggling between tasks. And it made me think of a riff that Seth Godin has about, he's like, I can teach people how to juggle. He's like, you got to spend 25 minutes at the beginning just throwing the ball and letting it drop. And it it was a combination of whatever he was saying in the video and then remembering that Seth talks about juggling isn't about 
catching the ball. It's about throwing it. And then I had like a, I think it was like, it felt like an epiphany. And I'm like, it's not only about throwing, but it's about being able to let it drop, having the patience. So that was going in my head. And then I think Rory even said something about patience. So there's, there's just something in my head where I'm like, I need to explore that, take some time because there's, that's something that I I've pushed up against is the act of letting something drop destroys me. If I don't make a deadline or if I don't get it done in time, the idea of how do I set myself up so that even if I'm letting little things drop, it's building the skill for me to move forward with the better muscle memory, the better feel so that sooner or later I don't. That's like one of my notes in there. I'm like, I don't even know how I got to it. Mm. I went off on like this little tangent, just like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Multitasking, right? We don't actually multitask. We're just task switching and just stuff quicker, like that. right? Yeah. We're trying to. So I was listening to a podcast on the way home from Harvard Business Review, Idea Cast. And this might be about prioritizing a little bit how you should do time blocking and take your projects and put them into your time blocks. And then have a conversation with your supervisor or whoever you're working with and say, okay, so this is what my week looks like from how I'm spending my time. These are the projects and the content areas I'm spending. And here's my list of additional things that I've been assigned. Now, if there's things that are a higher priority than what I'm spending on, let's come to an agreement about what block comes off so that can go into the block. I thought that was kind of interesting too. And then be able to have the conversation of, and if I'm not doing this thing, that's going to affect those people over there. I have all this other work I still have to do, but I'm being prioritized or I have this priority. And yet I know this is happening in the background and not getting done. Yeah, it was interesting. They were talking about the unwritten agreement that employees have with their employer and really saying, if your priorities don't fit into the time you have allotted for your work day. And not everyone's on an eight hour work day, but you shouldn't have to work every single evening and every single weekend straight. I mean, some positions potentially, but the general rule is how do you, how do you make sure that you're not doing that? So the other thing I wanted to talk about was just this three dimensional model that uh, Rory Vaden suggested. Do you want to talk through it? Yeah. So he, cause he went through like time management 1.0 and then time management 2.0. And then this is, let's move on thinking about what's important and what, what's urgent. The Stephen Covey thing. Yep. How important is it? And then how urgent? And then the thing, and this kind of, I think I wrote this down before he got to it. So I was like proud of myself. He brings up significance. Yeah. How long does the task, let's say matter? It adds this other dimension, and it's what we've been talking about for quite a while is wanting to do significant work and having a significant life, making our days good days. When you add that as a third dimension into how we're going about doing our work, whether it's personal or professional, it just kind of busts it open and it clicks for me and it helps me get a little clarity, even though it's not like it's going to be smooth sailing forever, but it's just like another perspective to add and to implement with these other tools that we've known about for a while. So what did you think about when he started talking about this? Well, I thought, again, I I think I'm with you. I thought that, yeah, it's almost like the secret ingredient in time management, because it's not just managing the time, it's finding ways to multiply it, like the title. Yeah. (laughs) Right. If you think about spending your time on the things that are going to not just be important and urgent, but really focus on things that are going to make a significant impact in the future that are going to save you time, make the future better, that's where you really should be spending your time today, where you think that you can create more time tomorrow. Yeah. So did he talk about borrowing time? As like, is that, it's kind of like what prioritizing felt like, but I'm not sure. My notes, I say borrowing time, question mm-hmm. mark. So after I took some other notes and was thinking about, I wrote down like prioritizing and patience. And then I wrote down this borrowing time, question mark. <laughs> and I, it says, 
It's not about borrowing time. It's about what are you willing to fail at with the time you have left. And then I wrote down significance. And I think that might have been before he said significance. But I think I underlined it after he said it. I'm like, ooh, like I was I was getting there or like I'm I'm on the same wavelength as this. I really like this. And so to me, then when he started talking about significance and adding that as a layer to how we're approaching these things that we say we want to do, I'm just like, yeah, it's got to be worth it to me and to other people if it's going to be significant. And Mm -hmm. like, that's kind of what that means is like, it's, if I pick the things that are worth it, that I I would try, even if I don't get it right, that's going to be a really good use of my time and I'll be able to learn from it. That feels significant to me. You went, you went really deep. I just, I was in my head. (laughs) (laughs) The thing that's coming up for me right now is I'm thinking about Seth Godin's book, Song of Significance. Yeah. And really that that idea and that concept of you may not always have all the the money to give people or all the accolades or recognition or fill in the blank. But if you can provide significance to that work that people are willing to show up, they're willing to do the hard things, they're willing to potentially fail together. So that's what I'm thinking about as you, as kind of your yeah. your take on what significance well, is in this model. Well, and because I'm informed by that book, all the, the feelings that I have when I think of that word now, I've felt those before. We've talked about this. I like I was feeling the the that part of missing <laughs> for yeah. years. And then Seth gave me these words. I'm like, oh, that's significance. Like that, that thing I feel like I'm missing in my work is significance. Then I see it again here and I'm like, okay, we, community of people, like-minded people like us that dig into things like this and Seth and Rory, okay, we have a language now, like a better, more accessible way for us to communicate about this stuff. And it just, it just kind of lifts you up, I think, and allows you to to kind of go on with it. So I, just, I get all jazzed up and then I write heady things in my notebook, apparently. <laughs> so anyway, like he showed that slide, right? With adding significance through like the cube where on the X and Y axis is important and urgent, right? Yeah. The things maybe I was thinking about were bigger projects that are harder to decide to take on because they take a lot of brain power, thought, strategy, but if done, they will free up time and resources in the future. One of the things that I'm thinking about in previous roles, I have worked with writing large grants to support really critical functions in the institution that the institution just didn't have resources to do. So thinking about one of the Department of Education grants that I wrote was able to bring in $3 million over a number of years. Thinking about doing that was incredibly difficult because we didn't have a lot of individuals on staff that could lead it, had written a successful grant or been part of a team that wrote a successful grant like that before. And so I took it on and carved out the time (laughs) to do it because it was important very important because I knew I could improve student success and completion. I knew that I could decrease financial aid cohort default rates um, by writing. I know it's sorry. My eyes are going to start glazing over when you start using all this jargon. (laughs) (laughs) No, but but it's, you know, those are important big goals, but ultimately helping students be more successful. It was urgent because there was a timeline and the timeline got moved up and the significance of it Uh, I know five years doesn't seem very long, but five years of sustained funding and infusion into an organization to really tailor and focus in on student success to, to improve and create more positive outcomes for students. It's why I do what I do. It makes a huge impact, right? It makes a huge impact and it's significant to me personally and my values and why I get up in the morning. So that was an example that I thought where I knew... It was hard for me to set aside that time, the evenings and the weekends and the edits yeah. 
<laughs> I remember, I think I woke up at like four in the morning one day, or, or maybe I didn't go to bed until like three in the morning because it was like Easter weekend and I was emailing back and forth with someone that was helping with edits, trying to get this thing done. I remember sitting on the like floor of our our bedroom with my laptop from work, you know, with all the lights off, you were snoozing. So I knew it was late. Yeah. Because you're a night owl. If I was, yeah, then, especially then, if I was in bed, it was two or after. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, <laughs> it was late. But I knew it had to, I knew I wanted, I was compelled to do it because I knew it would give the institution resources that it needed to set itself up for the future and its future work. And not just future work as in, in the next three months or next week but really building the structures and the systems in place to do the good work moving forward. So that type of work that you do, where you're part of something that when you do your work, it scales versus the type of work that I do right now doesn't necessarily scale. And so when I see things like this, that's why I send it to you because I'm like, oh, Laura has the type of job where if she sees his focus funnel trademark. I don't think I saw that. Did you not? Hmm. This is like the whole thing that par partially blew my mind. Okay. So we'll just, we'll kind of talk through it here so people get a, an idea. It's a way to set yourself up, go after your tasks, right? Like to, to dumb it down. What am I going to focus on, right? And so you have your task at top, at the top of the funnel. And then it goes through eliminate, automate, delegate. And if it goes through all of those, then it's in your lap. And then you have to decide, am I going to concentrate on this now mm. or am I going to procrastinate and do it later? And if you procrastinate on purpose, that means you do like a TBD and say, I'm going to revisit this later, which means it goes back to the top of the funnel and you do the whole process again. Mm. If you have a task and the eliminate phase is, do I need to do this even? Yeah. If you can't eliminate it, it goes to the automate. What can I put in place that makes this like, I maybe have to invest 30 minutes right now, but then I won't have to really think about it ever again, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you can't do that, then it's delegate. Who can I give this to? And like his example was, oh, I don't have anybody that can do it as good as me kind of thing. And <laughs> you don't necessarily think like that. I mean, I, I know you know, but I love how much you're willing to give something to somebody and say, show me what you got. I know you can do it. And you build people up. And so that, that's what really stuck out to me is I'm like, oh, like this is something like, like it's hard to do though, because the time, the time restraint, yeah. like if it, if it's so urgent, I don't have time to teach somebody how to do this. But then, and I think he even goes in to talk about, well, you don't think you do, but then if you keep putting off getting more people to help support you, you're just going to run out of your own resources of time. Right. All of that I thought was pretty powerful and kind of cool. Right. Like it makes sense. Yeah. But the thing that stuck out the most to me was he's talking about procrastination and he's like, but this is procrastinating on purpose, which is being patient. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I do both. I think it actually made me feel good about like, and I try to not call myself a procrastinator over and over and like label myself that because I'm trying to shift out of that. I know I have a tendency to do it, but. I wanted to ask you if I'm not too far off base here. I'm fairly patient when it comes to thinking through and making a decision, say like buying a TV, right? Yes. Like if it was up to me, I would put four hours of very patient thought into getting the best one. We should be uh, like video recording. My eyes are just yeah. like. So to me, it felt a little empowering. Not that I want to lean into the fact that I can procrastinate. And to me, that's not something I want to do. But if you're doing it on purpose, that means you're waiting for the right time or realizing that it, you can wait to do that thing. It is not as important. And there's some other layers to it. But that, that right there is intent and in being able to have the forethought or the ability to, to see this is important, but I know I don't have to do it right now. You don't remember seeing the funnel in the talk? No. Oh. I don't know how I missed it. Because I remember the like what you're talking about. Yeah. It's probably what you do all the time. That's probably why. And that's why I brought it up. Because I'm like, I bet Laura does this a lot. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Even like eliminate. 
and maybe this this might not be the time to go into this, but the podcast I listened to from Harvard Business Review because I wanted to try and like shake up the conversation about time and how do other people do this and but one thing that I thought was interesting that they brought up around eliminate and I don't know if this is eliminate or procrastinate on purpose like responding to emails we've talked about that I'm not always the best at my email management but one thing that I do And this might be a procrastinate on purpose. You tell me. But one thing I do is if there is a big chain email and there's five to 10 people on it, there's response after response after response after response. In the past, I used to hop on there and try and fix it right away and like hop into it. And now I kind of read and I don't normally insert my voice unless it's needed. So it's kind of strategic restraint on my part, Mm -hmm. where unless it needs to be said and need to be said by me, I don't always invest my energy in the very beginning of an email chain that's going back and forth with 30 different replies. I think that's more eliminate. Eliminate. You're aware. And that's like a really good example of something that's urgent to a lot of other people. It's important to some extent, but not urgent on your part. In the Harvard Business Review podcast, they were talking about email. The individual, and we can link it into the show notes, but the individual who was talking about it said that email is set up to elicit an emotional response and set up to make you feel like you're being more productive than you actually are. He likened it to shaking somebody's hand, just like shaking hands. If somebody puts their hand out, you automatically just go and shake it oftentimes without even thinking about it. Maybe not now, but... Mm -hmm. And so with emails, he said the same thing, where oftentimes people send you an email and you feel like every single email that you get sent requires and deserves a response. And that's not necessarily the case. If you don't send a response back, the person that sent it to you is going to be okay. I'm like, whoa, okay. We grew up when email was new to the masses. Right. Like we used to be so excited to get email. Now it's like, oh. If you, if you wouldn't text me, don't ever email me kind of thing. <laughs> and don't you dare call me out of the blue. Oh, gosh. Even when you call me out of the blue, I'm like, this is aggressive. Give me a heads up. <laughs> kind of kidding. But You're not, so sweet, but not really. But not really. <laughs> the thing, though, is what I think is so interesting is you always pick up. If it was really bothering you, you could just let it go to voicemail. I can't, though. Why? Because that's just not how I work with you. Oh, it's true. Of course, if I go to the store for you and I have to call you and I have a question about something I'm supposed to pick up, I could call you 20 times and you won't answer. And I come back all disheveled and sweaty and I made a, (laughs) you know, I made a, I made a game time decision and you're just like, what's going on? I'm like, I tried calling you like 20 times. I go, my phone was on silent. I'm like, yeah, I found that out. (laughs) Come back with raisins instead of chocolate chips. Like, what did you do? I wouldn't do that. I'm trying to trying to think of all the interesting things Keith has brought home from the store while he was left to his own devices. So that the other thing I just want to talk about and touch on mm-hmm. is something that the podcast and I think this TED Talk too talked just a little bit about the blending of your time between personal and professional. And the content I was consuming this weekend was also talking about, okay, so if you have 24 hours in a day, break it into eight hours for sleeping, eight hours for working, eight hours for you. When I started thinking about it that way, I'm like, there's no way I have eight hours for me, right? Take an hour. There's my commute. That's not for you though. That's the tricky part, I think. Right. It can be. It can. That's why podcasts are great. (laughs) That's true. But I guess what I'm trying to say is trying to set up your time in a way that recognizes both your working life and your personal life and your wellness is something that I'm not very good at. Like the different buckets, right? I mean, I'm really good at sleeping when I don't have insomnia. I'm really good at it. You're really good at going to bed. Yeah, I am. I'm not good at going to bed. We're like the opposite. We're so funny. Yeah. I woke up a lot last night. I wasn't used to being in the same bed as you. No. <laughs> it's not like I do somersaults or anything like the kids no, when they were I little. No, felt like I was. I was like, this way, that way. I'm awake. I'm not. He's here. He's not. So the figuring out the different buckets isn't the hard part, but figuring out how to dip into each one for me in the allotted time 
is a little tricky, but that's what I'm working on recently. And seeing a talk like this where it adds that third dimension, like a reminder of if it's important, that's something. If it's urgent, that helps. But is it significant? Is it because what I'm really trying to do is like, what is a good day for me? And how many of those can I have? I have to pick the things that are going to make it a good day for me. That's just the way my brain works or it's helping me think about I'm playing more guitar. Yeah. That makes a good day for me. Just like you were playing piano, getting up earlier so that I can get my writing done before I move on to my, it, it makes for a better day for me. I feel like I've accomplished more and that feels significant. So what are you going to do with all that stuff going around in your head and how are you going to going to think on it some more or where you have any like actions that came to your your brain well um, i mean i think the thing that i've been thinking about is around the personal and so i have a work schedule that's pretty well defined i know when my meetings are or evening meetings etc the thing that i'm trying to figure out the workshop i was doing is they were saying you should schedule the things for you first on your weekly schedule, look and figure out where is it that you're spending time with your morning routine and planning? Where are the times on your weekly calendar that you're getting movement or activity? When are the times you're spending with your family? When are the times that you're spending meal prepping, right? I guess setting aside all your personal time, scheduling that first, and then fitting in your wellness things and then your work. I mean, that's not ideal. What's not ideal? I'm just, I'm trying to think through when I'm doing other things that are important to me, journaling, working on a big project, things like that. I tend to get distracted by my own thoughts and ideas about other things that I should be doing. Some things are really obvious, like, oh, you should go on Instagram or, oh, You should check and see whether or not that package you ordered is going to be delivered today or tomorrow. Those sort of things where I can pretty easily be like, nope, I'm not going to do that. But other things are a little bit more meaty. Like I put on my, my calendar, like write a blog post about this. And I put it on our calendar, but I didn't quite get to it. Did you reschedule it? No. You should do that. I should. Because you procrastinated. I procrastinated on Put it back to the top of the funnel. Yeah. The thing that I'm struggling with right now, okay, I know I am struggling with this. And this comes back to the podcast I was listening to. If you have a to-do list, and I'm one of those people that has a to-do list with lots and lots of different, right? Keeps carrying forward over and over. They really said those are the outputs that you want to have happen, but it doesn't take into consideration any of the inputs that need to happen in order for that to happen. And sometimes my to-do lists are a combination of tangible things, really easy things, big strategic things, and things that could be procrastinated later or delegated. And so I guess I guess I use my to-do list somewhat as a parking lot for my own head to try and manage my time and giving myself a parking lot to collect all of the ideas and the projects and the things that eventually should get checked off. (laughs) In the workshop I was listening to this weekend, they said that that on their team, uh, they call it the squirrel cage, (laughs) not the to-do list, but the the list of of ideas that are not right now ideas, but to do later. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was funny to call it the squirrel cage. But but I think that's maybe where I'm struggling a little bit is is looking at that as my parking lot, but then trying to figure out if I can't just prioritize, I guess maybe going through this and thinking is, are there things I can simply eliminate? Are there things that I can, if they're going to be recurring automate, what can I just give to somebody else? And then where should I focus my time? Yeah. I mean, that could really help. I'm pretty good at finding the strategic work that needs to be prioritized that's going to have the most significant impact. But when I get busy, it gets harder. I guess what I was trying to say about creating a to-do list or a parking lot or a squirrel cage was really trying to create a space so when you are focused, concentrating on implementing something that 
hits all of those pieces, important, urgent, significant, that you're able to free up your mind to concentrate on that and to minimize those distractions that I know oftentimes lead me off and pull my attention in different ways because it's easier to submit a travel reimbursement sometimes. It's easier to reschedule a meeting into a different room. (laughs) Things like that. Sometimes those logistical things or the easier things end up on my parking lot because my brain wants to pull me off of that deeper work. So I am focused on the things that I know I can check off quickly because I want that satisfaction of completion, of achieving, of doing. And so maybe bring that back to you talking about like your personal time. Yeah. And finding ways to satisfy that completion, finding ways that recharge you so you have more capacity in your work to not get distracted by needing little wins maybe or something like that. Yeah. You alluded to it, but what kind of content have you been getting into? I have spent the last week or 10 days really trying to read things that are kind of fun to read. And so I uh, started and finished the book Lessons in Chemistry, which is really good. Then I also read some in the book By Yourself, the F and Lilies, which I know I've been reading, but but I'm getting through it. And it's it's pretty funny. Can you do one more? Sure. I've also been listening to the new Green Day album that dropped on the 19th. Yeah. Child One, huge fan. And I absolutely adore that. And so um, I've been listening to to some of that and connecting with him on that. What about you? So I went down a, I don't even remember how, I went down a rabbit hole again, uh, a music rabbit hole. <laughs> mm. I think it started with The Clash and then it went to Lou Reed and Metallica, just rocking out a little bit. And then I got my guitar pedal out and I was playing a little bit. So yeah, listening to some 70s and 80s hard rock, punk type stuff. Um, and then that Fisk show that you, you mentioned, I was watching that a little bit. Yeah, been focused on playing some guitar and listening to music. Cool. Well, should we wrap it up? Yeah, let's do that. All right. We'll see you next time. Sounds good. All right, bye. Bye.